And now... Ladies and gentlemen... Please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to PreneurCast. You know, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Don Gosher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if we want to. Visit us online at PreneurMarketing.com. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. Don Goucher here with, as always, Pete Williams. Hi, Pete. Hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, This week, folks, on the show, Pete is talking to a really interesting guy, actually, Toby Jenkins from a company called Blue Wire Media, co-author of a book called Web Marketing That Works, which, of course, we were dying to read to see if they knew what they were talking about, and we'll You'll see what happens there later on in the show. He's also an Olympian, First up, too. Don't forget that. He's an Olympian. You have an Olympian on the show. You always just you spoil it. You give it away. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yes, folks, we have an Olympian on the show. We'll come back to that, obviously. There's, there's a pattern with these people you interview, Pete. They're all a bit fit. I'm not sure I'm, I'm with this, by the way. <laughs> Uh, you just, I don't know, maybe you're trying to edge me out. You, maybe you're, you're interviewing new candidates for the spot, like, you know, so you can just talk about fitness. Maybe. We're going to change the podcast to a fitness show. Yeah. So let's go, let, let's, let's go back and do some, I don't know, let's do some boring stuff like, I don't know, hey, business? <laughs> 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 so this week, um, on the last show, we talked about the infrastructure stuff that we're going through. Um, and... We, we, we normally do a, do a round robin about what the projects we're working on, what we're, but this infrastructure thing really has kind of taken over in the last couple of weeks, hasn't it, Pete? Yeah, it's, we've, after a, a lot of back and forth, a lot of planning, we are making a move to um, migrate pretty much everything we do here uh, at Preneur Group across to Infusionsoft. Uh, it was, it's been long, a long time coming. We've kind of hummed and hard between Entreport and Infusionsoft and a few other different platforms and services. and. At the end of the day, Infusionsoft seems to definitely be the way to go. It is pretty powerful. Um, you've been inside there with me playing around a little bit and have seen how excited I've gotten with the automation and processing and stuff you can do uh, inside Infusionsoft. So I'm, I'm super excited and trying to keep my foot uh, on the brake as well as the accelerator because there's just a lot of power that we can bring with this thing. So uh, it's, uh, it's super exciting. Yeah, I think actually what we'll, what we'll do is when we're a little bit further along, we might have a talk about what what we went through the decision process. Well, but right back at the beginning, we really ought to talk about what Infusionsoft actually is. You know, what kind of a tool it is, what and what part of the processes that are involved in the the Preneur Group businesses it, it's it, it's going to be involved in, where it fits into the whole system and the the flow, and and also how the different elements of the system affect the seven levers. Mm. So I think that's a really, really important show for us to do when we're a little bit more stabilized with it. But we just wanted to let you know, folks, that that's where we're heading. That's what we're working with at the moment. Um, working through some really, really clever folks uh, that are helping us along with that as well. Um, because, you know, when you do something new, it's always good to bring in a, a consultant or, you know, an expert. So uh, lots of interesting stuff to keep you updated with on that. But just thought we'd tell you where we're going with that one. That's what really we've, we've been up to. Um, I'm not going to bother asking you if you've been training or anything like that because it's just encouraging you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so we'll wrap it all up in one go with this multi-purpose conversation that you've had with Toby Jenkins, author, uh, co-author of Web Marketing That Works, Olympian, and um, an all-round good guy, really. Toby, thanks for your time today, buddy. Hey, thanks, Pete. No, thanks for having me on, mate. Awesome, man. Now, before we get into whole, the whole marketing and business sort of stuff, I have to ask you, what was the village like at the Athens Olympics? Oh, look, mate, it, it was uh, the whole Olympic experience was amazing. Um, the village was nuts, really. You know, you're walking around and I think, um, so 2004, the superstar of the um, village was that uh, the Chinese basketball player, the guy that had been playing in the NBA. Oh, uh, yeah, Ming. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. he was just enormous and he was rolling around and all the gymnasts were these tiny little girls getting photos with him and that kind of stuff. He was probably, I, I think Kobe Bryant was in there as well. Yeah. Um, you know, there were some there were some pretty big names in there, so it's pretty cool to be sitting down in a dining hall and sort of eating with all those, those kind of people as well as, you know, the superstars of the Aussie team like Thorpey and uh, those kind of guys as well back in 2004, so... 
Very, very cool. Now, that was for yeah. the, the water polo, wasn't it? That was your sort of starting point. Were you a swimmer in the in uh, in high school and sort of fell into water polo? Was it always water polo? How did that kind of grow? Yeah, I had um, I started off swimming in primary school um, and really enjoyed it. But then got to high school and my sisters had both tried water polo and basically got a bit jack of the black line swimming up and down it. <laughs> I know that um, feeling. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we're not alone there, but. Um, yeah, just loved the ball sport and the team sport and, um, yeah, just fell in love with it basically and, you know, played for 20 years from year eight and just gradually sort of made my way up through the ranks and down to uh, Canberra for Institute of Sport for a year, um, playing overseas professionally and then, you know, ultimately Athens was the highlight as, along with um, three world championships as well. Very cool, mate. Very good. Did you, did you get the tattoo? Did you get the Olympic tattoo? No, no. Oh, okay. I thought I might if I if we'd won a gold medal, but um, <laughs> without the gold, I, I couldn't quite make it stack up. Ah, fair enough. So it's one of those sports you don't really think about being well supported or having a program at the AIS or even being professional overseas. And I guess it's sort of a it's a sport that obviously has a huge following, particularly in Europe, as you mentioned. But it's making Australia you don't really hear much about it at all. Even during the Olympics, it kind of doesn't really get a, a mention except for, oh, yeah, here's, you know, at 3 a.m. in the morning uh, on the on the second sports channel, here is the, the replay of the game. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a shame like that um, in some ways. I mean, yeah, I guess we're competing with four football codes, cricket, swimming, um, and, you know, realistically, Australia is a pretty small nation to support you know, yep. another professional code in, in any sport. I mean, even some of the other other sports, you know, that get better results as well, to be perfectly frank about it. I mean, if we've won yep. back-to-back gold medals, it would mm. be a different story. But, um, you know, we haven't. And so, yeah, a lot of the Aussie players go overseas to play and, um, you know, that's just the way it is. But, I mean, that's also ends up, you know, you've got a bunch of people who are playing it because they genuinely love the game too. No one's certainly no one's in it because they've got any illusions of making serious coin from it. That's for yeah. sure. That's I guess the purity of it's pretty cool as well. I think to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be nice to be paid for your time and effort as well at times. But um, you know, there's a lot of lot of uh, enjoyment and satisfaction. And you know, I've travelled the world every year for for probably you know a decade really. Yeah. Um, through my water polo career and uh, just seen places that you know been to Kuwait to play, been all over the world, Eastern Europe, everywhere, um, you know, China, Asia, Pretty all through cool. America and stuff. Yeah, it's extraordinary, really. And you're still playing now? Um, I'm not, actually, not at the moment. Um, I gave it a bit of a breather about two years ago and um, have enjoyed the extra time, to be perfectly honest about that, too. And uh, invested all that into writing a book. That's it, mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Very cool. laughs> that's been a bit of a time sink, that's for sure. No doubt. We'll definitely touch on that for sure during our conversation. But I want to sort of just to go back a little bit because we first met five, six, maybe seven years ago at a Jay Abraham event in Sydney. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm just keen to sort of hear how you made that transition from, you know, water polo to the boardroom and, and starting the, the Blue um, blue Wire Media business and, and, and how that kind of, I guess, grew and scaled from that perspective and then we'll you know, get into the whole book and, and what you're doing now. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, mate, look, I mean, I guess I'd all the way through, you know, one thing is, as I said earlier, you know, water polo was never going to support me um, but and I always sort of was interested in business, I guess, um, but water polo was absolutely the focus and then um, once, the, once I came back from Athens, I thought, oh, well, you know, there were a couple of other guys, other mates of mine who were sort of keen to get into business as well. And so we sort of sat down one day and we were tossing around like jumping trampoline, you know, those bungee trampolines. Yeah. <laughs> one of the lame ideas because one of the guys had just come back from Mallorca. Adam, it was actually Adam Franklin, had just come back from Mallorca and he'd seen those pumping over in Mallorca. <laughs> and um, Anyway, so we threw a few ideas around and basically decided on – uh, the web side of things because, one, we thought, well, it's definitely not going to go away um, and, well, it's well and truly here to stay by that point. But um, And, two, we figured, you know, if we ever got really short of web design work, we could just go and look for rubbish websites and hit them up to do it. So we figured it wasn't going to be too hard to prospect. Um, and then also it cost us nothing to start. 
and I think that was probably actually the um, the bit that really solved solved it for us, as opposed to you know borrowing money to invest in a bungee trampoline or any other sure. scheme. So, did you, did you, Adam, have like coding skills? Had you done like development at university or anything like that? Did you have any of those sort of tools of the trade to take to the marketplace? <laughs> Not in any serious sort of format at all. <laughs> Um, I'd done one subject through my business degree in HTML, which was just appalling. And I think Adam and I think we'd both probably just passed that one. Um, we did have a third mate who kicked off with us who did have some skills or at least enough to convert a template into a website. Yep. So um, <laughs> we were – the first website was a template, you know, from I think it was monstertemplates.com at yep. the time and then um, that we did for a client. And we the original business plan was just to, you know, take templates and – remodel them for people um, and, you know, charge them a premium for it. And uh, But we threw that one out after three weeks pretty much because we weren't, um, weren't so proud of the actual end result of that. But So was, was, mm. was this the first business you'd ever run? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. So, yeah. so how did you grow then? Obviously, if you've got, you know, a team of, of three people with no real design development skills, so, you know, you're not the mechanic who knows how to actually fix the engine. Like how did you actually scale and grow that business with, you know, minimum overheads but without the skills to deliver the product? Yeah, well, I mean, the guy who did know how to deliver the product, he actually left after a couple of months because mm-hmm. um, he was working full-time at the time and opted down that path. Um, but, yeah, as and I just decided, you know, the piece that we were most interested in was sort of learning how to manage and market a business, really. Cool. Those, those were the two bits. Yep. Um, and so we basically, you know, we went down the prospecting path, you know, literally knocking on doors, um, which failed miserably. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, cold calling people. Um, and then sort of, you know, we learned what qualifying a prospect might be, which was, you know, plucking instead of cold calling out of the yellow pages, we were cold calling out of the Brisbane news at the time. And then, you know, basically we figured, oh, well, um, maybe we can try to go to them with an offer, which was, you know, a mock-up of their website and we found that that sort of developed a bit more trust. Yeah. But ultimately the the place that we grew the business from was the people who knew us. Mm. Um, the network, our first, the first website that we actually did was um, a referral from my water polo coach had met a guy in the at the pub who'd said, oh, I need a website. And so my water polo coach said, oh, I know a couple of guys <laughs> who are doing that. Unfortunately, this guy knew even less than us. So um, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it a, and yeah, he, and it sort of took off from there. Very cool. And I, I think yeah, that, that's how a lot of great businesses start is where you just have this passion for something. And you know, we still talk about it now from the telecommunications business that I own. Uh, mm. Myself and the business partners, none of us, you know, after eight or nine years, still know how to install a phone system. You know, that wasn't our skill set. We were very similar to you in that we were all about sales and marketing and delivering a good experience for the customer and then worried about the mechanics after the fact. And we've spoken about that on the show here quite a bit. And I could kind of cover your experience with the door knocking and and things like that uh, Mm. in the book, uh, Web Marketing That Works. Um, And, you know, one of the things I found really cool is that, you know, it's a little insight, but it's, it's one that people sort of probably don't take the moment to think about, and you kind of touched on it then, is that, you know, you started cold calling um, after you failed with the door knocking um, side of things, <laughs> and then you went, okay, let's actually go to people who are already spending money advertising in the media. So, mm-hmm. obviously, they've got a budget to spend on generating leads. So, you know, that's a much easier and somewhat more qualified or pre-qualified audience to go to, and you kind mm-hmm. of just obviously iterated from there to sort of work out the next step. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, you know, I guess because you're lean and hungry in those early days, particularly, you know, you're really trying to make sure that what, what you're doing is getting a result. And it's so clear, again, particularly in the early days, it's so clear as to exactly what, you know, where did this sale come from? When you've only, when you've got no sales and you get <laughs> one sale, the learning gap from zero to one is enormous. Yeah. And, um, and you can be so clear as, and understand so clearly why that sale happened and, uh, and then, you know, look to duplicate it, replicate mm. it many, many times. So, so how long after you started the business did you actually attend that Jay Abraham event where we first met? I reckon it was um, might have been year two yep. of the business. Yeah. Would it, 
Would it have been 2006, do you think? I reckon, I was trying to think before we got on the fire. I reckon it was, yeah, 2006, 2007, I reckon. It would have been around that time. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it would have been, yeah, eight, no, eight, eight or so years ago now. Because so, how, how, how long had you guys been in the business at that point? Um, so, I was trying to think. So, the business has been around since 2001, but I came along uh, a few years after that. So, it probably would have been, yeah, a couple of years in for us or three years in for us as well, which would have been, yeah, around 2006-ish as well. So, yeah. Similar sort of time frame. How do you find Jay and sort of stumble into that world? I always find it interesting of how people kind of stumble into that sort of, you know, education and, and, and business advice kind of space. Yeah, I genuinely couldn't tell you. I actually think ads may have come across him um, and, you know, like, liked his work basically yeah. and just thought, oh, you know, this is interesting. Someone, we may have had a, you know, a ripped DVD, sorry, Jay, um, <laughs> at the time. But, um, you know, we ended up buying the course or, you know, That's someone had lent us some sort of information yep. and we thought, oh, you know, let's get along. And I remember actually even the sales experience because we were on a phone call with the sales team at the time and she said, oh, well, you know, what's your, what's your um, average sale? And we said, oh, you know, it's probably worth a couple of grand to us. And she said, well, do you think you'd learn one thing from this course that's going to generate you a sale in the next 12 months? And we were like, oh, yeah, that, you know, chances are yes, that's true. And she said, well, you know, it's three grand for the ticket or whatever, 2000 for the ticket or yep. something. So why don't you come along? And it, and it just it did seem like an absolute no-brainer from a value proposition. Mm. And did you sort of model that in some of your propositions moving forward? Because obviously at the end of the day, selling websites is a very similar sort of sale if you frame it right where it is like, hey, do you think this website can generate you two more leads for your business? Did you sort of model that kind of pitch at, at any stage? Yeah, yeah, we certainly did. Um, yeah, we definitely did. I yeah. think it's really important for a lot of people to think about too. Is I, I see this a lot when I sort of consult with people, and you probably experience it as well. Is that you know it's almost going through the experience and trying to pick those lessons out is just as helpful as actually the information that was presented at the event. You know, mm. I know, like you know, I've gone to Tony Robbins events before, and I've gone like once as a you know, a participant, so to speak. And yep. the following year, I've gone back to the exact same event, sat in the audience like every other participant, but looked at it from a marketer's perspective of like, how is it all structured? How does he market? Where's the upsell sequence and that kind of stuff? So it's actually yeah. experiencing the same thing. So I think a lot of people don't really, when they are listening to a podcast or going through a sales experience to buy information or, or experience something like that they're going to sell, actually taking away from that. So I think that's really smart on your behalf of actually saying, okay, look, this is what Jay was doing. I'm not just going to wait until I get to the event to start learning from this. I'm actually going to start looking at what they're doing to sell me into this and see how I can model and, and swipe and deploy it into my own business. And that's, I think, really important as well for people. Oh, yeah, and particularly online, Pete. Like, yeah. There's, you know, people sort of come to us for email marketing advice, for instance, mm-hmm. um, and you know, what we do is we sit down and we sign up to who we believe are the best 10, 20 email marketers on the planet and, you know, you pull their emails apart. Yeah. Like they're, they're not giving you stuff that's even six months old. What they're actually trying to deliver to your inbox is their absolute most current thinking mm. um, in how they can, you know, drive action, you know, drive open rates, drive click-through rates and ultimately drive action and sales and revenue and looking at and deconstructing those processes is, you know, probably more more helpful to you than, um, you know, even potentially buying their swipe file in that particular instance because you've actually got the their real activity right in front of you. Man, I couldn't agree more because it, it really is. It's like watch what they do, not what they say. Mm. So, so with that having said, if people really want to learn from us, they should buy a website and a phone system. Is that what we're saying? <laughs> <laughs> we'll go and look at them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, so moving on from this, something that you talk about in the book quite a bit is a bit of an underlying theme, at least at the start of the book anyway, um, and directly at the start of the book because the Ford is uh, by David uh, Mim and Scott the author of The New Rules of Marketing PR. Now, you've sort of done a lot with him, for want of a better term, um, over a period of time. And I, I really want to sort of, I guess, deconstruct that a little bit. You talk about it in the book, and you talk about a lot of other stuff in the book, which, again, what we'll cover. But I think mm. the way you connected with David, the way you built a relationship with David and what you've done with him since, I think in its own right is a really good case study that kind of covers a lot of the stuff you talk about in the book. And I'd love to kind of deconstruct yeah. that and pull that apart um, in this sort of same way as we've just been speaking about, if you don't mind. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so, yeah, so tell us about, yeah, about you know, 
your description of who David is and, and, and what he stands for and why you, you felt like it was worth connecting with him and, and how you went through that process. Yeah, sure. So if I can, I might even take it one step back. Please do. Um, Pete. Yeah, two. Um, so the guy who actually introduced us to Vern, to um, David Mim and Scott was Vern Harnish. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with his work? I know the name and he's actually come up to me recently a couple of times but never actually connected with him directly. Right. Um, really interesting guy, a business coaching business. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically, so to take it all the way back, basically numbers of our mentors and, um, you know, peers at the time had said, hey, guys, you know, you should have a look at this one-page strategic plan, which is Vern Harnish's what we call the flagship content in the book. That's Vern's. Mm-hmm. And so what he does on that one-page strategic plan is he distills the concepts from um, things like good to great, you know, BHAGs and, um, you know, your 20-year goals and that sort of thing mm-hmm. and then helps and provides a, a, it's an Excel template to go from 20, 20 years out to five years out, one year out, you know, what's happening in the next 90 days. Mm-hmm. And so we, and it's free to download on his website. So if you go to, um, I think it's gazelles.com, you'll, you'll be able to download his one-page strategic plan. Yeah. And so we used it ourselves um, and thought, wow, you know, this is interesting. And those same mentors slash peers then said, hey, you know, you, you should read Rockefeller Habits as well, Vern's mm-hmm. book. Um, and so from Vern's book, we were like, oh, yeah, here's how you actually fill out the template. Yep, that's awesome. Um, and then we went along to Vern's um, event when he arrived in Brisbane and have subsequently travelled the world to listen to the guy. You know, <laughs> um, we chased him down in Atlanta in a couple of, a couple of years ago and, um, you know, we try to get along to his event almost every year because, you know, you hear the same thing but you, your mind is open to new ideas and how you're going to apply it depending mm-hmm. on your current situation. So what we realised was that in Vern's process, that one-page strategic plan, was actually the piece that opened up everything that he offered. And so we thought, oh, well, why why reinvent the wheel? How can we do that for ourselves? And, you know, in the process, we'd been reading a ton of books and blogs and everything else. And then we were talking to Vern. Um, I'd emailed Vern about something. I can't even remember. And he said, well, who you need to talk to is David Mim and Scott. He's going to be at my next event. You know, come along and ask him a question. He's taking questions from the audience via satellite. So we went along almost almost exclusively just to ask David that single question, um, which was, do you need, you know, all of the tactics involved with these new rules of marketing and PR are fantastic and the concept being that you need to help people first, you need to offer them value and free stuff and give it away so then people, you know, so then you can broaden your network. Um, And then, yeah, so we got to ask that question and um, he gave us a response and then basically it's his book, New Rules of Marketing and PR, really tied all the other books together, we felt, in terms of the language that we could now use, which was particularly the buyer persona, Mm-hmm. And so defining your buyer persona, defining you know, a target market essentially, who are they, what problems do you solve, um, what action do you want them to take, how, you know, how are you different, how are you going to get to them, you know, why, sh- why will they trust you, um, all of those questions sort of we drew out of his books and you know, a number of others, Seth and um, you know, Jim Collins as well for that matter. Yep. But, and then we put it all in one spot. And we thought, oh, you know, this is, okay, that's a framework in which you could develop your strategy around the online piece. Mm. And then the, so then the flip side of that was um, we were also battling to explain to our clients how it all fitted together, how the web all fitted together, what should you be doing with a website and how does search work and backlinking and social media and all that stuff. And so we... Put, went through a whole bunch of iterations around, you know, visually how do we actually explain this to someone, our client. So we were really scratching our own itch yep. in that regard and finally came up with this diagram that really, thank goodness we had a great designer at the time because she managed <laughs> to distill, distill our rubbish um, into something that was really meaningful and, and simple to understand. And from that we were like, oh, okay, this is awesome. And so we were really excited by you know, on one side we had the visual, on the other side we had the um, table that sort of would allow people to go through the buyer persona and we thought, oh, you know, this could be our one-page 
like Vern's one-page strategic plan, this could be our one-page plan. Yep. And we were so excited by it that I, you know, on a bit of a whim really, um, shot an email off to David, Mim and Scott and said, hey, David, look, you know, we've loved your book um, and Adam and I, you know, we've put it into this one-pager and would love to know what you think. Mm-hmm. Um, and he came back and said, oh, look, guys, <laughs> love it. Um, I really, you know, that's a, would you be prepared to sort of make a couple of tweaks? And if you are happy to make a few tweaks, then, I'd, you know, I'd love to co-brand it and share this with my audiences because I think this would really help to convey my concepts to the audiences, which is exactly what we were trying to do was take his concepts and share them with our clients. Um, and so, and so he said, yeah, let's co-brand it and distribute it as creative commons. And, um, and we were like, Oh, wow, that'd be incredible. Yeah. And so he started talking about it, um, and, and presenting it at all of his, uh, at all of his presentations of which he does many and is a great, um, presenter. And then, um, when the new, when the round of um, new rules of marketing and PR, the new edition came out, um, he got in touch and said, "Hey guys, would you be prepared to? Um, would it be okay for me to include this in the book? I'd love to. Uh, I think it's a really useful piece, and we can get it in there. And if that's okay with you guys, then you know, what do you think? Yep. <laughs> and I mean, we guys have yes sold hundreds of thousands. Yeah, yeah. It's not a, it's not a difficult question to answer. So, so let me ask. Um, let me break this down a couple of points because there's a few sure. things you said that I think that happens a lot is that as someone goes through a process and is quote unquote successful with it, i.e. connecting with someone like David and having a, a, you know, this sort of not really joint venture, but kind of a co-branded thing happen together. There's a lot of things in mm. hindsight you kind of take for granted. So mm. one of the things you mentioned is you see him an email. Yep. Now you kind of, you know, obviously this is what everyone does brushed over the point from going, okay, I went to this event that Vern put on and I asked David a question via satellite mm-hmm. to then sending him an email. Sure. What actually happened in between then? Did you actually liaise with him at all or did you, was that just a cold email that you got off his contact page? Like how did you actually make that connection to, to ensure he got the email? Because I think for a lot of people, and you sort of touch on this later in the book as well, uh, web marketing that works, which is definitely worth checking out. But like, how did you actually go about building that relationship so he actually saw that email and responded? Yeah, look, I, I think, um, yeah, it, it is a great question because I have skipped steps definitely. Um, initially... Uh, having asked the question and got a response, you know, I was able to sort of get my question in at the end in question time at the actual presentation. But afterwards, you know, um, sent him an email to say, hey, thank, thank you very much. Um, we've really loved your book. And I think it was literally just a thank you email mm-hmm. um, at that time. And then um, went through the whole process of the actual um, – Actually, that's not entirely true because we probably went on, we, we did go onto his blog and sort of left some comments there. We were certainly linking to it and we had written numbers of blog posts about his concept. We'd reviewed his book. Um, okay, yeah. So when I start looking at it, there's probably a fair bit more activity there um, that led up to the email itself. Mm. Now, I, uh, I think that's important because I think a lot of mm. people aren't willing to put in that groundwork. Is that if you think about it, so you, you went to an event you sort of made yourself known and you sent a thank you email. Now, like, let's be transparent about this. Is that everyone's got an ego. And mm. I haven't met David myself, so I can't sort of talk about the size of his ego, but everyone has one. And, like, if you write blogs and if you are sort of out there putting out information like he mm. does, you want the feedback and you read the feedback. No mm. one in that sort of world very, very, very rarely will ignore an email or ignore a blog comment. They do get read. So by mm. seeing that thank you email, it sort of puts you on their radar a little bit and they, they see the email, read the thank you and go, okay, and move on. But then if they, you know, a week later see your name pop up again, um, you know, on blog posts, occasionally like, you know, they'll probably stumble across your blog post that you're written about him and linking back occasionally. So like, you know, you are becoming familiar in the back of that person's mind of, of who you are that you exist. So when you do send that email, there is that small connection already being built. And I think it's really, really important that people don't do that without willing to put in that, you're not really to sort of, you know, plant the seeds to get the harvest later. And it's an overused analogy, but I think that's really important. I think you, you, you showed that by doing the way you did. Mm. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Absolutely true. Um, yeah, you need to, you need to have built the, a relationship long before. And, and to be honest, it, we weren't even asking at the time. Yeah. You know, it's not like we asked. It was just a, hey, you know, here's what we've, you know, here's our distillation of what you 
of your concepts in your book. Um, and it was, it was a shot in the dark yeah. and with no ask on it, no expectation that there would be any follow up even. I mean, you know, the fact that we got a reply from our point of view is humbling, let alone the escalation of that reply to be, Oh, well, let's co-brand yeah. um, was just mind boggling. And, and perhaps even that, you know, like without, without the expectation and without asking means that, you know, you, you're leaving it up to them as to whether or not. And I, I actually, I'd, I'd be really surprised if we had, would have got the same result had we said, hey, would you like to co-brand this with us? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, I, you know, from the outside looking in, I completely agree is that if you're going there pitching something, it's like, well, where's the value exchange? But if he's coming to you, it definitely shifts the tables quite a bit. Mm. Massively. Very cool. So obviously that's given you guys a lot of exposure through David's network and his books and all that sort of stuff, which is, which is amazing. Mm. Yeah, it's been, you know, it's been really, really cool. And, and, you know, I mean, when you look up to these guys and you genuinely um, admire them for the work they've done and the thinking they've done, it's just such a thrill as much as anything. <laughs> you know, the, the exposure is an absolute bonus, um, no doubt about that. And, you know, that, that particular web strategy planning template has been downloaded tens of thousands of times from our website, um, let alone the numbers of people that David's spoken to over the you know, over the intervening time, which has probably been hundreds of thousands. Absolutely. Uh, so, so so speaking of that template, obviously that's available um, from the website and, and through the book. And I think in the book you've got 30, 33 different templates of various types in the yeah. book. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that. Let's, let's move on to the book because I think, you know, the, the whole story of how you came to be with David is really um, insightful and helpful. But let, let's get to the core of what, you know, I'm pulling your time away from the business for, and that is to promote the book. Let's be transparent about it. Yep. So let's talk about the book. What? Uh, sorry, the question, the, the blah, blah, blah. Web Marketing That Works is the title of the book through Wiley, who published my first book, so a great publishing company. So um, tell us about the book, the project, what it's about, how it came together, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, sure. So the book started out um, actually, well, I mean, you know, we've been publishing content for ages. We've been putting these con- tem- templates together for ages. Um, we've been putting, uh, you know, we had offline events. And actually the, the first point of t- contact with Wiley was they actually paid to come along to an event of ours, Social Media Down Under. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, to sort of start exploring social media for Wiley as a business. Um, and so that was the first sort of opportunity to meet them. And they'd been subscribed to our email list for a while. And then um, it was actually on the base, on the back of that, they said, hey, look, you know, social media is a topic that we are keen on um, because it's a hot topic in the marketplace at the moment. Would you guys be interested in writing a book about it and, you know, sharing some of what you've learned and all that sort of thing? And so it was, um, you know, in that respect, Wiley were the publisher that we most wanted to work with um, out of anyone if we could have picked one in Australia and um, and so we were, we were pumped um, and I guess, you know, on the back of everything that we'd written, um, the templates we'd created, you know, really it was about distilling the 10 years down into something that people could take away and just really get to the how-to bit because for us the, you know, the likes of David Mim and Scott, Seth Godden, um, a whole bunch of people, you know, Jade Bayer, with utility, you know, there's a whole heap of books around um, the why to market online and, and the rules that have changed and um, the new sort of mindset that's required, particularly online, to make it work for a business. But the piece we felt that was missing was, okay, well, now I understand why, then how do, we, how do I put that into action? Yeah. And I think that's really where the templates have resonated more than anything, more than any other, any other content we've done. The templates are the things that drive open rates and click-through rates on our emails. It's the stuff that gets found on search engines um, because people are looking for frameworks, you know, to take their understanding and take it and take an idea and put it into action and how do they do that. Absolutely. Um, a template is a great place to start, which ultimately, you know, we were writing the book and um, going through it all and that bonus 33 free templates actually came as an afterthought, um, well, not a huge afterthought, but it was probably a month or two into the writing process that we thought, well, you know, the piece that people have been, you know, have really gravitated towards are the templates in all of our marketing. So why not, 
let's include them. Let's develop some new ones for the book as well and cover off all the various bits and pieces so we can really make the most of the book. Sure. Um, and to try to also bake in, I guess, you know, like Ryan Holiday talks about in that growth hacker marketing, um, that idea of baking in the, um, the shareability mm. of, of a, any product. And we thought, oh, well, you know, the templates will give away and then if people like the templates, then, you know, hopefully they'll be inclined to buy the book too and that's really been the philosophy. Yeah. Very cool. So in, in terms of, um, you know, someone who listens to, the, listens to the show and our conversation and sort of thinking about buying the book, besides the 33 templates, what are some of the big takeaways they're going to get from uh, checking out web marketing that works? Confessions from the marketing <laughs> trenches. <laughs> well, um, one th- I, can, I can tell you what you won't get and that is um, – Things like IBM case studies, Coca-Cola case studies, um, all the highfalutin brands, you know, Fortune 500 stuff that is really not applicable to the vast majority of businesses. Yeah. Um, so we've told our own story, um, for better or for worse, in terms of you know the the steps that we've taken in our progression to understanding how it works, um, and then. In terms of the big takeaways, I actually think, you know, it's been fun exploring that web strategy planning template and the David Mim and Scott story with you, Pete, because that to me is the piece that if you can get that piece right, then you can really hang your hat on that and get leverage from that for a long time. And to this day, nearly every client that we eventually sign up has downloaded that before meeting us. Mm. It's, um, it's been incredible lead and um lead and sales tool for us it's amazing and i mean you know when we have the first meeting we go through that with the client yeah <laughs> i mean it's as simple as that you know how how might this work for you and it becomes a a sort of partnering discussion versus being oh we're trying to sell you a website well let's let's take a step back and see how it can work so i think the big take home is the flagship content and that concept of a flagship piece of content Mm. Um, is probably you know the biggest biggest lesson that we um, and hence why it's right up front. I think it's chapter three or something after the web strategy section. So um, yeah, it's been it's been an interesting lesson, that's for sure. Cool. Something you mentioned there about how you actually implement the template into the sales process. I just want to like finish up around that because it's something we talk about quite a bit. Uh, on the show, particularly as people are working through the seven levers of their business and trying to increase their conversions or at least their items per sale. But having some sort of you know strategy guide or checklist in place, it can actually very easily make any additional items per sale um, seem obvious and almost required. So have you found that using that template, you know, someone might come in even after reading the template wanting to get a website built and like just a basic website built hypothetically. Do you find that mm. going through that strategy document with them, it opens up their eyes and makes it easier for you to sell, you know, content creation or social media strategy stuff or additional services that they probably weren't originally thinking about purchasing when they actually came and sat down with you for that first conversation? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, if if someone came to us and said, Oh, you know, I'd like a website, um, that's almost actually a red flag for us in terms of <laughs> You know, is is this the right type of client for us? Because um, typically, the people that you know it works best with are those who have built numbers of websites and are trying to figure out why hasn't this worked. Yeah. Um. And so, yeah, sitting down to say, hey, can it? You know, if it's okay with you, can can I just give you a ten minute education piece as to how how the web universe all fits together, and then we can, and then let's dig into how that might look for you guys in terms of increasing traffic, driving conversions and, um, you know, ultimately sales. So, uh, yeah, without a doubt, it, it allows us to take a conversation from micro up to macro, yeah. which is um, absolutely where we want to be. And very much in, in a non-direct way, it's like this, that you, you used the word discovery before, but is that discovery approach to selling that actually sort of helps, you know, increase the, the um, items in the shopping cart, for want of a better term, that they go, okay, they can see how this o- – overall picture works from a marketing perspective and that they understand they need all the other elements. It makes it a much easier and indirect sale too, which I think is such an important thing. So that's very cool. Mm, yeah, definitely. Awesome, man. Well, let me ask you the one final question that we ask everyone on the show and that is the uh, what's the question I haven't asked you that I should have? 
Wow, that is a good question. Um, far out. I'm actually not too sure, mate. No, I think you've asked asked a ton of them. No, um, it stumps most people. I, well, the question I was going to ask that I didn't mm. was something around speedos and water polo. Cause you see the photos <laughs> of the girls having accidents, but I don't think I'll go there. I'll leave that one off uh, off the list. But um, yep. Let's, it's let me ask you this. a good place to leave it off so, the list. <laughs> so at Amazon.com, you can get the, the book, the Kindle version, uh, or if they want to sort of find out more about the templates and just what you guys do directly, uh, mm. Blue Wire Media, is that the place to, to start? Yeah, bluewiremedia.com.au backslash book will actually get you straight to those templates. Awesome. Um, and then, you know, bluewiremedia.com.au will give you an introduction to the company. But in terms of getting familiar with us, and, it, and that's the bit that, holds the most value initially, then just go straight to the backslash book. Awesome. Toby, mate, appreciate your time. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pete. Really appreciate it, mate. So, again, that was one of those conversations that just did not go where I thought it was going to go. Cool. Uh, uh, And and as always, you asked the good questions. Um, I really really enjoyed the bit where you you said – you know where, where where they got them they they went and this is a lesson for everybody this is what i'm highlighting it this is really important they approached mr super world famous authoring speakering person and <laughs> and the way Toby just went across yeah yeah we dropped him an email and yeah he just like included our stuff in his book and and you went hang on a minute <laughs> <laughs> and the reality of it was that it was a much longer process yeah which which started by adding value, giving feedback, turning up, learning about the guy, all those steps. And we've talked about these things before. You know, on various shows, we've talked about how you approach people for partnerships or, you know, to, to just to talk to them. Um, and when you asked your question and got, the, you know, to Toby to think back, I think he gave a really good account of, of what we would have said people would do in order to go from, I don't know this guy, to I'd like him to... You know, do I'd like to work with him if at all possible? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's you know a lot of people brush over the details of what some of the most important things are when when they tell a story, and that's why I wanted to dive back in there and get him to sort of really dig deep at how he built that relationship with David because that's the the, the key, killer part of that is that what what actually it took and the effort it took because so many sort of people see this blog post or a, a podcast where the person goes, oh, we just reached out to him and made contact. And then the rest, is, you know, the rest is history. I'm like, yeah, that's fine, but it never works like that. Very rarely does a cold email get you those sort of results. It does take time to invest in the course of the person, show you're serious as a student, show you can get results. Like that's effectively how my relationship with Ed Dale started. Is that um, I was at an event he was speaking at. Uh, I bought one of his programs at the time. This is you know years ago. Uh, took a whole bunch of action, reached out, became a good student. Said to, um, and it's like I had a successful business at this time. It wasn't I was like just starting out. I was already relatively quote unquote successful. My book was already published, all that sort of stuff. And then, so I had a big relationship with Ed. And then Ed did the challenge, and I reached out and said, "Hey, let's do a uh, an auction to raise money for charity." And then and took that on. And then obviously from there, we built up a very very strong friendship and relationship. And you know, it wasn't just oh, yeah, I reached out to Ed and you know blah blah blah. Like there was a lot of steps involved. I put my money where my mouth is to get his attention. Uh, and that's what sometimes you need to do. Yeah, and and I, as I say, I think that Toby Toby gave a good account of that in the end mm. um, when you when you when you pressed him on it. But it, it it is easy to skip over it, and it is also easy for people who are outside of this looking in to think that you know either oh well it's easy for you to say that or it it it, it was easy for you but I can't do that. And it's it's both sides of the coin. You know you can do it if you're willing to put in to use your phrase, Pete, the hard yards. Yeah. You, you can reach out to people and you can be noticed, depending on what you want, depends on how you approach it. And, you know, as I said, we've, we've talked about this before. But uh, it, was, it was an interesting thing to pull out of there. There's lots of, lots of really cool stuff in there, though. I really like um, their, the way that they've got themselves now with their lead funnel. We're talking, you know, obviously it's one of the seven levers, is, is traffic, opt-ins, conversions, all the, three of the seven levers, in fact. Um, and Toby, Toby highlighted a couple of those things about their process, uh, about they, how they pre-qualify people, pre-educate people, um, all great stuff towards the seven levers, the top, you know, those top 
elements of the seven levers um, by you know these these check sheets that they give out. Um, I mean, you know, the, basically, the, you, know, you really could replace replace me with him if you wanted to, because it was all frameworks and checklists and and you know that kind of stuff. Um, so it was really, I thought, I really enjoyed that. It wasn't what I was expecting, because you know, we we were interested in the book that they wrote, and I do think it's you know it's, it's a great book. It's a, definitely a good covering of the topic, but I found myself their business more interesting than 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 the book as it were mm-hmm. from from the questions that you asked him cool so super another excellent chat in the bag folks beautiful now just to wrap up this show um i want to again sort of reach out and say thank you guys for listening obviously there's a plethora of podcasts you can invest your time with and we do appreciate you uh, investing it with us and you know if you do love the show we really would uh, also appreciate you to share it and tell your friends. So if you're listening on a mobile device while you're, you know, on the train to work or you're out walking the dog or anywhere in between, you know, right now you can rate, you can review, you can share the show in the app. You don't have to remember to go, oh yeah, I'll do that next time on my laptop or my desktop and forget about it, which is inevitable. So if you've got a couple of seconds now and really enjoy the show, we're up to 138, 140 odd episodes now. So there's a lot of content available. If you do like it. Uh, the way we'd love you to return the favor is just with a quick tweet, a quick social share, uh, or a review on iTunes or the Android app, whatever you're listening to the show on. We really, really do appreciate you investing that five seconds and saying thanks. So if you do that, and folks who have done that in the last week, uh, it does uh, really touch us. We look at it, we see it, we do appreciate it. So thank you very, very much to those of you who have done that recently. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a big, um, big effort. Uh, to a certain extent, and we uh, appreciate it. Absolutely, folks. Definitely from me too. Thanks for listening. If you are a new listener to the show, someone has shared this show, recommended it to you, um, just to let you know if you didn't already, and, and a reminder for everybody else, over at preneurmarketing.com is the home of every episode of the show. You can download copies. You can listen to them on the website live there. Also, that's where all the show notes are, links to everything that we talk about in the show, all the you know, the authors, their websites, the books we review, things like that. Everything's on preneurmarketing.com. So do pop over there. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a comment below any of the shows. Uh, we, as always, love to hear back from the Preneur community. So with that, Pete, I think we can wrap it up there for this show. Cool. All right, guys, we will uh, speak to you next show. Oh, just a heads up. In the next show, we will be talking about another of the seven levers. This time we're going to talk about increasing the number of transactions per client. That's the number of times somebody comes back and buys from you, which is a big, big win in the seven levers. See you all next week. You've been enjoying another fine episode of PreneurCast with Pete Williams and Dom Gocher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at www.preneurmarketing.com or drop them a line via preneurcast at preneurgroup.com.